So Rosemary, just tell us about yourself and your work and what you do. I'm a paranormal researcher and investigator. This really has been a life path for me. I've been interested in these topics since I was a kid. And professionally, I have a background as a journalist, which has been great training for the kind of work that I do. I've been full-time in the field since 1983. And I research and investigate hauntings, cases of spirit attachments, um, sometimes they're dark entity activities. I get into ufology, ETs, UFOs, mysterious creatures, also into spiritual development, past lives, reincarnation, dream work. Uh, all of these topics are interrelated. The shadow people, I believe, are a form taken by jinn, and it took me a while to get to this conclusion. I started researching shadow people in depth in 2004, and after a few years of intense investigation, I concluded that shadow people are a form taken by jinn. This research started as a result of getting a lot of emails and inquiries in a short period of time from people describing pretty much the same kind of experience, a bedroom invasion by a dark entity that looked like a tall man wearing a cape or a coat and often with a hat. These were terrifying encounters for people and they were wondering, what is this entity? What does it want? How do I make it go away? So what are the different types of shadow people that people encounter? There are different types of shadow people. There is what I call a core experience. And this is the bedroom invasion, where a person wakes up, usually in the middle of the night, to find in their doorway or by the bed what they first might think is a person. It's a very dark silhouette that looks like a man six to, about six to seven feet tall, wearing a coat or a cape and often a hat. There are no features. Uh, sometimes people see eyes, but usually uh, they're featureless. And these figures radiate an intense amount of malevolence. People feel very frightened, like they're going to be attacked. Sometimes the entity doesn't attack, it just observes, which is quite terrifying. And sometimes it does attack by jumping on the person in bed and uh, attempting to choke or suffocate them. The odd thing about these entities is that they seem to have mass when they want, and they seem to be able to be paraphysical when they want. That is, if they reach out and attack someone, uh, the individual feels like they're being assaulted by a very uh, muscular, heavy human being. But when these entities want to disappear, they will go through walls, windows, they will disappear as smoke, vapor, they will uh, slide under the bed, go into the closet where they disappear. So they seem to have the capability of being physical in our realm, and yet uh, they can defy the laws, natural laws of physics, at the same time. I wondered for a long time, why do these entities need to wear hats? And usually the hats are crazy hats. They're out of fashion, they're weird looking, uh, they range from uh, old-fashioned stereotype detective hats to floppy hats almost like fedoras, stovepipe hats like the Victorians wore, cowboy hats. Why does an entity need to wear a hat? Well, there are two possible reasons. And one is that these are intelligent uh, entities. Uh, they are very smart. They know exactly how to engage with people. They know what they want. And they may have figured out that their silhouette looks a little more terrifying, or maybe even a lot more terrifying, if they're wearing a hat. Uh, hats are often symbols of authority. Uh, but I think that it has more to do with how they shape shift, because uh, the jinn have really no physical form. Uh, they can shape shift into any form they want, and when they do, they often have deformities. They don't quite get everything right. So, if, for example, if they're mimicking a human form, they may not get everything exactly perfect. And a hat can cover up a very misshapen head. Many times when these entities are seen without a hat, their heads do look very malformed, kind of uh, weird, rumply, almost like a, a very weird potato. And uh, so the hat, I think, covers uh, a lot of imperfections. I discovered in the course of my research 
that a significant number of shadow people experiencers were also ET abductees and contactees as well, but especially abductees. And uh, this information was volunteered. Uh, and it was sort of like, oh, by the way, I'm also an ET abductee, if that helps. Well, I noticed a very high incidence of this, higher than you would expect for uh, an overlap of experiences. So uh, I started researching that. And I went back to uh, the respondents in my database to ask them about their ET experiences. I also started including ET abduction and encounter experiences in my questionnaires and discovered that quite a few people who were shadow people experiencers also were abductees. So going more deeply into that, I discovered, and this took me quite some time to piece together, that uh, the shadow people will often precede or follow an abduction. Um, that is, they'll show up maybe a day or hours before someone is going to be abducted, and they show up in the aftermath of abductions. They don't seem to be figures who are doing the actual abducting. So assuming then that shadow people are jinn, which I believe that they are, then what are the jinn doing uh, involved in ET abductions? Are they working with aliens? Are they shape-shifting into aliens? Are they spying on what the aliens are doing? Uh, what exactly is their role? And we simply don't know because none of these entities really sit down and communicate with us to tell us what their master scheme is. We, we have to uh, do our best to, to piece it out. But uh, the jinn being masterful shapeshifters, um, they may be interested in the abduction scenario to find out what's going on, why are aliens interested in us. It may be a way for them to piggyback on the ex experience because abductions are very terrifying. And what the jinn want uh, is um, the human life force which we give off in a terrific wave of energy when we're terrified. It's the adrenaline fight or flight. And I believe that the jinn harvest this energy. So they may be piggybacking on the abduction scenario as a way of getting what they want from human beings. The fact that the jinn are masterful shapeshifters makes it very likely that they play other roles in the abduction experience as well. Primarily the reptilian, uh, which would conform with jinn lore. Uh, their favorite form is the snake, going back to ancient times. And so the reptilian ET may be one of the latest forms of that shapeshifting. And they also have the capability of shapeshifting into all the uh, aliens and beings that we call ETs that we encounter. They could very well masquerade as the greys. They could masquerade as the praying mantis types. Uh, people who have had recollections of their experiences on board ships during their abductions often describe reptilian entities that are hooded and often wearing hats, another characteristic of shadow people, uh, who seem to be in charge of a lot of the abduction experience once they're on board. There are many beings who have a sexual interest in us, and shadow people certainly fall into that category. The jinn do as well. And if the jinn are using the shadow person form as one of the main ways that they interact with people, I believe they are, then a sexual interest would be part of that. The jinn have had uh, sexual relations with human beings going back into antiquities, just like other kinds of beings, including ETs, fairies, even angels. And uh, jinn-human hybrids are written about in uh, ancient folk tales and lore, uh, even in uh, biblical terms, it's not uh, specifically stated in the Bible, but uh, King Solomon, who was interested in the Queen of Sheba, um, she was rumored to be half jinn. And this would have made her a very powerful person because she would have had the supernatural abilities of the jinn as well as a human form being able to uh, exist for long periods of time in our reality.
The Nephilim are the offspring of the Watchers, and there's a very short reference to them in the Bible in Genesis. And that reference says that there were beings called the Watchers who were set in the heavens to look after human beings. And while they were doing that, uh, they were also called the Sons of God. Uh, they took a great sexual interest in women, so they decided to leave their posts and cohabit with women. Um, and in exchange for the sexual favors, they taught secret arts to human beings, supposedly skills and knowledge that human beings weren't yet ready to have. And uh, this made God very angry, and um, he um, decided to uh, wipe out uh, all of the impurities uh, by the flood and pretty much start over again. Now the details of this account are told outside of the Bible and the Book of Enoch has one of the uh, longest descriptions of it. And uh, that story is told that the angels, the archangels, are alarmed by the Nephilim because they're a race of giants and they're cannibalistic, they're bloodthirsty. Uh, they're vampiric, just like the jinn are, vampirizing the life force, only they, they were doing it literally through blood and flesh. And uh, the angels go to God and uh, report to him that uh, this depravity has spread around the planet. Uh, and so that's what causes uh, God to uh, become angry, decide to uh, send floodwaters over the earth. He orders all the Nephilim to be rounded up and uh, locked away, and the Watchers punished as well. Well, apparently not all of them were demolished because there are references later on in the Bible to um, races of giants that, that survived on. So remnants of the Nephilim might have lasted uh, into modern times. Do you think that would account for like the black-eyed kids or black-eyed beings that people report seeing? I believe that the black-eyed kids and black-eyed people, because we have many cases of black-eyed adults now, mm -hmm. that these are another form taken by jinn. They share a lot of similarities to shadow people. Uh, they have a more human-looking appearance. They're not a dark silhouette. Uh, and many people mistake them for real people at first until they realize that there's something very strange and off about them. But they also seem to have the purpose of harvesting the life force off human beings, and they just use different tactics to do that. So uh, this would be in keeping with uh, a jinn tactic. Uh, if, you, if, if you were uh, a race of beings that wanted to use human beings as uh, fodder for food or entertainment, um, you wouldn't want them to get too accustomed to you. Uh, if they became used to you in, in one form, that uh, uh, they would always approach or attack in one way, uh, you'd, you'd want to keep your game up by uh, coming up with new strategies. And I think that's what's happened with the Black Eyed Kids. They're just a new strategy for a very old game. Well, sleep paralysis is a natural part of sleeping, where, uh, and we can often wake up while we're in that state and feel paralyzed. But I believe that the entities who prey upon us at night when we're vulnerable are very well aware of this state of sleep. And not only do they make use of it, they may be able to mimic it, to cause it to happen at will, or to intensify it. Many of these uh, bedroom invasion encounters occur during, during these times of paralysis where the individual can't move, they can't cry out, they feel completely help, helpless and that really intensifies the fear. Uh, they may be aware of presences, they may be able to see uh, a shape moving around the room, uh, they may sense a presence, they may hear uh, sounds like uh, muffled footsteps, they may even smell vile smells but they're they feel unable to defend themselves. Beyond the, co the core experience of the bedroom invasion, there are other types of shadow people. And um, they fall into subsets. There's a subset that is attached to places on the land. I believe that these beings find portals or openings between dimensions. They live in another dimension. They're attached to the earth, but they're not really in our dimension most of the time. 
but they find places in our reality where the land gives them energy and that energy enables them to manifest and to interact with human beings. So they may be attached to land. This accounts for some cases where people have no experiences with these beings until they move on to a certain location and uh, they discover that they're very plagued by these beings. And if they move away, then the experiences stop. There's another subset of shadow people that attaches to individuals. And these seem to be for a variety of reasons. The jinn have indicated interests in generational bloodlines for their own purposes. And so they follow families, and wherever those family members go, wherever they move, whoever the descendants are, there seems to be a pattern of these kinds of experiences that plague them. Uh, then there are shadow people who attach to individuals on a temporary basis. They're very drawn to negative emotions. And so if a person goes through a lot of upheaval in life, like uh, disease, uh, a financial issue, a divorce, uh, loss of a job, something that really upsets them and turns their personal life into chaos. Uh, this is likely to generate depression, uh, unhappiness, a sense of hopelessness, and also anger. All of these emotions are very attractive to the jinn because they can feed off those emotions. And so individuals going through these kinds of crises may find themselves attacked at, at night by these literally energy vampires. And when they are able to recover and get their lives back into a better balance, then there's nothing for these beings to come for and they go away. So you're saying they, they feed off all those negative energies? They, uh, the shadow people uh, and jinn feed off negative energy. First of all, they want you to be absolutely terrified because when you are fearful, there is an automatic response from your body of fight or flight and it throws off a tremendous amount of uh, adrenaline. Uh, and I believe that they know how to harvest this. The same sort of adrenaline uh, is used in negative emotions that we, we generate uh, energy in waves and negative energy has a different vibration to it than uh, a happy, positive uh, energy. And they, uh, they feed off the negative energy. They don't want to be around happy, well-adjusted people. Uh, and so um, individuals who, who are having a lot of emotional difficulty may find themselves very vulnerable to these, these sorts of attacks. Now, there are some individuals who aren't necessarily unhappy, but they seem to have very thin boundaries to the spirit world. That is, their natural defenses are not as strong as most people. They tend to be psycho psychically sensitive. They tend to be what I call trigger people. Wherever they go, if there are spirits uh, on, of the land, if there are entities uh, who are looking for people to interact, there seems to be a light over these people and they attract that attention. Uh, and so they may be more prone to having encounters with um, predatory kinds of entities than other people through no fault of their own through their actions. They just have uh, very peculiar energy boundaries and they need to learn how to shore those up. Many entities, including shadow people and the jinn and ETs, have the ability to invade dreams. And this goes back to ancient times. Uh, we are quite vulnerable while we sleep. For one thing, we're usually out of body while we're sleeping, and uh, dreaming is an activity that is out of body. There's something about the change in our state of consciousness that seems to make us uh, more vulnerable to the influences of uh, spirits and other entities. And yes, they can uh, start with, it's literally called dream invasion, and they can start with uh, causing you to have uh, very unpleasant nightmares. And sometimes the nightmares and the bedroom visitations go on simultaneously. It'll be one and the other.
there are many ways that people can ward off attacks and even prevent ta attacks from happening again. However, as effective as the remedies are, they don't work in all cases. And that's because the circumstances are usually unique as to why someone is having these experiences. What works for one person won't necessarily work for another. But uh, one of the most common remedies against repeated shadow person visits is to turn a light on uh, and to leave lights on and televisions and uh, also computers. It seems that the generation of electrical fields and electromagnetic fields has a disrupting effect on the entity's ability to manifest and remain in a room or an environment. Sometimes this will uh, keep them away all the time, and other times uh, it'll work for a while and then it won't work uh, anymore. It's almost like they build up a resistance to it. Uh, people have also had success with what I call righteous anger. That is summoning up an intense amount of anger about being attacked and ordering the entity away. And anger sends out that kind of anger about uh, you will not violate me or my boundaries. That sends out a wave of energy too. It's like a pulse wave that can repel the entities. Um. Oh, you going? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, many people have found religious remedies to be very successful as well. Uh, they may call upon religious figures, such as in Christianity, calling upon Jesus or Mary or the saints, uh, even calling upon God, uh, reciting certain prayers like the Lord's Prayer. In Islam, there are uh, prayers and verses from the Quran that are cited that are very effective. Uh, every religion, in fact, has. Uh, prayers and verses from sacred texts and scriptures that repel the unwanted and negative. Those can be quite effective as well. I have found in my experience uh, consulting on many, many cases over the years that uh, these sorts of remedies in many cases are temporary. They last for a while, but um, uh, in cases where the entities are uh, determined to remain in a place or attached to an individual, something else needs to happen. In the case of entities attached to the land, um, there's there are usually uh, land energies or currents of energy on a property that uh, are beneficial for them. And sometimes those currents of energy can be altered, even relocated, with the help of a master dowser. Uh, it's uh, unusual, but I have seen that uh, occur. Uh, sometimes the entities can be uh, persuaded to go elsewhere or to, uh, to at least not uh, pester someone uh, if, they are, if that human being is occupying land that these entities also occupy. There may be some other way of uh, sort of making peace with them as a bargaining process. And in the most severe cases, uh, we almost have to treat it like possession, that um, getting the entity expelled also requires the victim to be able to build up their own boundaries, that um, they have to uh, shore up their, their sense of free will, their sovereignty, uh, their sense that uh, no being has a right to violate them in any way or their boundaries in any way. So victims often need a lot of psychological help so that they learn how to push out their own energy in order to repel these beings. I've had many experiences with them since I started researching them in depth. It's inevitable when you research the paranormal that you're going to encounter just about everything you research. And when you're dealing with intelligent entities like the jinn, who really don't want a light shined on them, they don't want people to know what they're up to, what they're doing, what their modus operandi is, what the remedies are against them. And so researchers like me will get a pushback. Uh, we'll get unpleasant phenomena, uh, they will attempt to do nightmare invasion. They will attempt to do bedroom invasion. They have many ways of uh, upsetting life. 
uh, through accidents, through misfortune. Uh, they can affect people around you as well, uh, your friends, your family. Um, it's like uh, they want to make as much trouble for you as possible uh, so that uh, you are discouraged from further research. I've had uh, also quite a bit of electronic interference. Uh, files that go missing, fi you know, write, uh, uh, write up reports and the files will go missing from my computer or they'll be corrupted so that I can't access them. If I'm on a radio show or, or um, uh, giving a lecture, uh, they will uh, disrupt the uh, AV equipment, the broadcast equipment, they'll put static on a line, they make noise, uh, they interfere. And uh, they may also interfere with the, the other people attempting to interview me as well. I've had um, stations literally get knocked off the air. I've had uh, station, radio stations, their, uh, their whole equipment uh, goes down uh, and they can't get on the air. Or hosts that suddenly get sick the day of the show and they can't do it. Uh, it's a, a whole raft of things. Uh, I've been through mysterious car accidents. Everybody has accidents, but when things start piling up in a certain way, uh, when you're on a line of research and uh, you have a lot of interrelated phenomena, it's usually the entities kicking up uh, a pushback to attempt to get you to drop your line of research. Have you physically seen them before? <clears throat> I have had many cases where I have, I have seen shadow people and uh, in various forms. Um, I have seen them um, usually without hats. Uh, and I've seen them looking like tall male figures wearing uh, a coat or a, a cape uh, with a very misshapen head. And again, this is in dark silhouette without features. I have seen them as um, very formidable black pillars. That's quite often how they appear as well and also as um, smoke and mist and what I call, tor they, they can look like tornadoes of swirling mm -hmm. ink. Mm -hmm. And I've seen them in that form as well. They have another way of showing up too. And uh, this is described uh, by many experiencers and it's called the predator effect because it's named after the famous predator movies where mm -hmm. the, um, the villain who was an entity, an alien, cloaked itself, had the ability to be invisible. And you would know where it was uh, by the ripples in the air. And so they can be almost completely invisible, but let you know that they're around because they will ripple the air like heat waves. But it's not heat that rises up from, from the earth and goes up. These are horizontal waves. Many shadow people, another kind of shadow mm -hmm. person, uh, many shadow people like to haunt what I call polluted areas. And when I've done paranormal investigation and I've gone to uh, places where the energy is very low and negative because of the things that happened there, like abandoned sanatoriums and prisons where there was a lot of unhappiness, uh, unhappy death, violent death, and uh, a lot of intense anger. Um, it seems to provide a cesspool of energy that attracts these beings and these places are famous for shadow people. Waverly Hills Sanatorium is one of them uh, and uh, it is possible to encounter these beings during the course of paranormal investigation. Uh, um, I don't know if this r relates but ever since I've been starting to research and go in depth and to start this documentary I've been getting a lot of synchronistic like numbers, like I've been seeing three 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 or one one one, eleven eleven. Is there a connection to that? There may be a connection between certain synchronicities and paranormal research. This happens to a lot of us all the time, and one of those synchronicities involves numbers. Now, when I have investigated what I call dark side entities, demons and jinn and predatory entities that are interested in um, attacking people, the number three will often show up. And in demonology, this is considered to be a hallmark of the presence of demons. It, it's a, said to be a mocking of the, the Holy Trinity. 
So the number three will crop up a lot or uh, people will find themselves waking up at 3 a.m. or 3.33 a.m. Uh, the number 33 will show up. Uh, and that's uh, quite common as well. So the number 111 would be a variation of that because it's another, you add three ones together and you get oh. the number three. 1111 seems to be a different kind of synchronicity for people uh, where you look at a clock or a watch and it's 11 minutes after 11 or there's some other uh, combination that 1111 shows up in. And uh, this is a higher vibration number uh, and it's tied to uh, kind of a spiritual awakening. And so I've always interpreted that number as something representing the higher forces, the higher energies. It would be more of a protective nature. And believe me, when we're out there investigating the dark side, we need all the protection we can get. It is possible to attach spirits to objects and of course in gin lore uh, the most famous of all is the genie in the bottle and the term genie actually comes from the word jinn. It's a corruption of the name jinn. Jinn is Arabic for hidden ones and the jinn do like to remain hidden. But uh, when the old Arabian Nights folk tales were translated into French and English the French uh, corrupted the term into genie and that's how we get genie in the bottle. So all these stories of the genie who lives in the bottle and can be uh, coaxed out um, by rubbing the bottle or by saying uh, an incantation and then the genie is obliged to grant wishes. That's one form of this. But uh, spirits, including the jinn, can be put into pieces of jewelry like rings or pendants um, and their energy is attached or bound to that. Uh, and it is done through uh, different kinds of magic rituals. Uh, there are many that exist all over the world for this. They can be put into almost any kind of container. And in fact, in exorcisms, they're often trapped into bowls or jars and then covered. And then uh, those things are often buried if the entity has been particularly troublesome. So uh, people can go onto the internet and see all kinds of advertisements for gin jewelry and a lot of these are fake uh, nothing's really attached to them but sometimes people get the real deal and an entity can uh, come along with a piece of jewelry and uh, if somebody doesn't know what they're doing or uh, they inadvertently release this uh, this being who's literally been tied to the piece of jewelry then it can get loose and uh, get out into a home environment or someplace else and create quite a bit of havoc. Uh, so when uh, sorcerers do this kind of work, uh, they have to be very knowledgeable, very careful, and it takes a lot of skill and power to do that and to maintain uh, the control over the entity because they are quite powerful and formidable and they will find their way out if they can. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, gosh, so many of them. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, one of the cases that I studied for years, um, and I, I do track some cases for years because they involve ongoing phenomena and unfortunately attempts at remedies, concerned um, a husband and wife who moved on to a, a piece of property that to them was their dream home. It was a country property and uh, it happened to be inhabited by uh, one of these entities that had been there a very long time and uh, was not pleased to have people living on the property. Uh, all manner of unpleasant phenomena occurred. They had poltergeist phenomena in their homes. Uh, things would go missing. Uh, the wife uh, once got herself locked in the basement uh, when no one else was home. A door slammed on her and then mysteriously locked. They had uh, smoke alarms that went off constantly even when they were uh, um, removed. They had their batteries removed. Uh, and even when they weren't connected to anything in the walls, they had nightmares. They had uh, bed shaking. Uh, their dog became possessed. They had uh, attacking bats. They had stinging bees. Uh, they had shadow people, um, 
it was uh, an ongoing onslaught all the time. And uh, we would try different kinds of remedies. Um, and there would be peace and quiet for a while, and then the activity would kick up again. Their health was affected. Uh, the wife's hair started falling out. She had um, uh, weight. Uh, she lost weight. Uh, she got anemic. Uh, they are started arguing all the time. That's a, another uh, disruption that can occur in a household. And uh, they were literally beside themselves. Um, now, we tried different kinds of exorcisms to uh, get, get rid of this entity. It, it um, wasn't interested in striking any sort of deal. It indicated that it didn't like people living on this land and it was going to pester people until they went away, which seemed to be the case because this property had had a lot of turnover, we discovered. Uh, and uh, so we tried different kinds of religious exorcisms. And uh, what often happened was uh, something would prevent the exorcist from coming on the property. At the last minute, there would usually be an accident, if not to the exorcist, to someone in the family that would cancel um, the, uh, the ritual. And this happened more than once, uh, and really serious accidents as, as well. I mean, very, very harmful to people. Uh, this went on for uh, several years and when it appeared that uh, they were not going to arrive at any lasting remedy, that the remedies would be temporary, uh, they, de they decided to sell the property. Uh, and ironically, uh, they had a great deal of difficulty selling it. It was like um, whatever was there uh, attempted to punish them then for selling the property and, and uh, they were finally able to sell it and uh, get peace and quiet. But the activity continues on the property. There is an entity there um, that uh, is Jin that has been there for a very, very long time and uh, it considers it their property and it does not like people who come and try to live on it. I run into these cases all the time. Um, have you, oh my, hold on. I'm gonna change out the memory card on this one. Okay, we're just gonna change the memory card. This one will last a long time. So are you are you getting material that mm -hmm. oh, is gonna yeah. be useful for you? Good. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll probably just do a couple more and that's it. Oh sure, whatever um, whatever you need. Alright, cool. Um, I just had the question, I forgot what it was. <laughs> I do, yes. Yeah. I, I, I get that vibe. It's like, oh, it's like it's very, uh, everything flows good. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah uh, I was a debater in school. Um, and, um, so, and I give a lot of presentations as well as interviews, and I also host my own radio show. Uh -huh. So I guess it, a lot of it just comes naturally to me, but it's a lot of practice and training over the years, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely get, get that vibe. It's very, like... I don't know, it's almost like you're talking, like, I think I was watching, like, one of the presidential debates, I don't know, just the way they, they talk and some of the things, like, it's very composed, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, it's like, I don't know, but it's good, it's good. Alright, ready? I think yeah. I have something. Um, uh, with this hat man or hat men, we're focusing on him, but there is going to be a large part of it, shadow people as well. Mm -hmm. Um. What is a story you would know of the hat man that was really also intense? Um, oh, like a bedroom invasion? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I've collected hundreds and hundreds of stories of uh, hat man, shadow person, bedroom invasions. And uh, there, there are two that I'd like to tell you about. And one involved uh, a man, a single man. Actually, he was a divorced father and he was in his mid-30s and he said that uh, he was visited by this uh, hat man uh, periodically and he never knew when it was going to happen. This was part of the terror, this ratcheting up of terror. But he said the attacks would always start the same. He would wake up and he would be paralyzed. He would know what was going on 
He could see and he could hear, but he would be unable to move or cry out. And he would know that this thing was outside the house, and that's how the attack would start. He would sense it circling the house, almost like an animal wanting to come in. And then suddenly, he would be aware that it was in the house. So there's, again, a ratchet up of fear. Uh, and he knows that this thing is going to get closer and closer and closer to him. And so suddenly it's in the house, and then suddenly it's in the hall, and then suddenly it's at the doorway of his bedroom, and then suddenly it's this, at the side of his bed. And what would happen in these attacks is that uh, he would be paralyzed and unable to move, and, and he would be deathly afraid that something horrible was going to happen to him. And just when uh, he thought that was about to happen, boom, the entity would vanish. Well, you would think, well, the guy would think, phew, well, got out of that one. Well, no, because it was um, very actually calculated psychological terror, because there would be no relief. It would be, is it coming back? Did it really go away? Is it coming back? When is it going to come back? And what is it going to do? So he lived in this ongoing state of fear, having these, uh, these experiences. Well, one night, this thing showed up. And uh, the pattern started with outside the house and inside the house closer and closer. Uh, only this time, the man was sleeping with his bedroom door closed, and he had the crazy idea in his head while he's laying there paralyzed that somehow this entity, who can go through walls and go through matter, but he has this crazy idea in his head that because his bedroom door is closed, it's not going to be able to come in. And he thinks, ha, it's not going to be able to come in because my door is closed. And as soon as he has that thought, the hat man thinks back to him telepathically, well, your son's door is open. And he knows instantly that this being is making a beeline for where his eight-year-old son is sleeping. He's paralyzed. He can't do anything. He can't get up. He can't call out. All he can do is pray, oh, please, not my son, not my son, not my son. And uh, fortunately, nothing happens to his son. But uh, he said that this hat man was so malevolent. He said the malevolence in this being was so extreme. He said it's absolute evil. It's the most evil thing that I uh, have ever encountered. And that was uh, the most terrifying experience he had ever been through. Now, I lost touch with him. I have no idea if he was ever able to break this syndrome or if these sorts of attacks continued and if they started in on his son. Uh, there was one other that I found uh, to be very terrifying, just reading about it. And uh, it came from a young man who was a professional wrestler. And uh, he said that uh, one night he wakes up in this state of paralysis and there's this hat man, this shadow person in his bedroom. And uh, it's generating this hostility, this evil energy and it comes and jumps on him uh, while he's, he's in bed and he's able to start wrestling with it. And he said, um, he said that this being tussled with him and it had tremendous strength. And he said, uh, I was in the fight for my life. I was never so afraid. Uh, this being had physicality and it was, uh, superior in strength to him. And he was a professional wrestler, so he was in the peak of health and strength. And he said uh, at a point where he thought that uh, he was going to be exhausted and have to give up, he was able to throw this being off and it disappeared. Uh, but he said, I've never been so frightened in my entire life. He said, I don't know what it was, why it attacked me, but I really thought uh, I was going to be dead. It's not unusual for skeptics to say that uh, people are having uh, fantasy uh, experiences or that this is just the remnants of a nightmare, that people uh, were still dreaming a nightmare and they thought they were awake if it's a bedroom invasion. 
And in the course of my work as a paranormal researcher and investigator, I've, I've never felt obliged to try to convince skeptics because uh, many of them are not going to be convinced. But I'm convinced because we have too many of these experiences that fit the same patterns. Thousands and thousands of them, just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, people all over the world who never met each other, never knew anything about shadow people or the hat man or the djinn, uh, are shocked to discover that they are having similar experiences to encounters that have been described throughout the ages. So the experiential evidence speaks for itself. And for many skeptics, that's still not enough. They will not be convinced until they too have their own experience. All right, that'll conclude the interview. Thank you very much. Oh, there we go. Cut, cut. Awesome. Great, well done.